read in your program, she was abducted in 1989 by right-wing death squads in Guatemala, and she was brutally tortured. Um, she will probably tell you some of that story. I want to point out that she's the founder and director for 10 years of Torture, Abolition, and Survivors Support Committee International, TASC. This is a very important organization. You should check it out. Sister Diana Ortiz. Thank you. I am here to share my reflections about the life experiences of torture survivors. And certainly, one of the obvious experiences we have is that we quickly learn that for the public in general, we don't know anything worth knowing. I ask you to think back to the TV programs, talk shows, print media pieces on the subject, congressional briefings and hearings, and many conferences on the issues of torture, except this one. How many times has a survivor been called upon to offer his or her views on this subject, a subject we know from the inside out. Not many, I assure you. For those who are willing to listen to us, it should soon be obvious that torture leaves no part of a person's life untouched. What I will share with you tonight is drawn from my interactions with fellow survivors over the past decade and a half. While there is no one single model that encompasses all lived experiences of survivors, there are characteristics or effects that are quite common among us. We lived through something unspeakable. At the point of victimization, we began to die a slow death. We are stripped of our dignity, our sense of control, and our very link with humanity. Trust is gone. Hope is gone. Faith is gone and security is gone. And we are prepared to say anything we think they want to hear so that they may more quickly kill us. In the words of one Honduran torturer, eventually they all beg to die. For those of us who do not die, what we have lost is replaced with alienation, a sense of betrayal, and a terrible fear. A metamorphosis takes place. Though technically alive, we feel more akin to the dead than to the living. People around us celebrate our survival while we mourn our own deaths. We are strangers to everyone, those closest to us, even to ourselves. We are no longer part of a world where once we felt at home. Listen for a moment to the words of the tortured Austrian philosopher Jean Amory. Anyone who has been tortured remains tortured. Anyone who has suffered torture never again will be at ease in the world. Faith in humanity already cracked by the first slap in the face and then demolished by torture is never acquired again. Many of us carry the physical scars of having been beaten hanged by wrist, arms or legs,
burned by electrical devices or cigarettes, cut or stabbed with knives and machetes. Then there are those with permanent head injuries, amputated limbs and the like. Each mark, visible or invisible, is a lasting reminder of what was done to us, a reminder that often brings embarrassment and even shame. What a cruel irony it is. It is the tortured and not the torturer who feels the shame. In 1997, as part of the National Institute of Mental Health Working Group on the Mental Health Consequences of Torture, I spoke with countless survivors. And I remember a young woman who, in addition to being subjected to waterboarding, had been raped daily by her torturers. They left marks on her body symbolizing their pride of ownership. I lost contact with her, but I thought of her very often. And one day, not so long ago, I heard from her. She had dared to take a risk of letting a person into her life. He knew that she had been treated badly in her country, but he still loved me she said, and we got married, she continued. Then the sobs came. On what was to be an important moment in their life together, her husband saw for the first time her breast. One of her torturers had bitten off her nipples. Another had branded his initials into her breast. When her husband saw her body, he left the room, never returning. While the physical act of torture may be assigned to the past, its psychological effects permeate the present and blight the promise of the future. So often, this is torture's intention. Torture is an attempt to obliterate a person's personality, to turn him or her into a quivering mass of fear, cowering in some corner of the world, afraid to look for the dawn. Torture does not end with the release from some clandestine prison, and it's not going to end for those who someday may be released from Guantanamo. It is not something we get over. It is forever, forever strapped to our backs. It constitutes a permanent invasion of our minds and our souls. Someone in uniform, a scream, the smell of a cigarette, perspiration, urine, whistling, heavy breathing, dripping water, clattering of keys, the sight of a dog, simply being in a cold, bright room, even making eye contact, being photographed, or a friendly embrace, any of them threaten to return us to that past which walks so closely behind us. Imagine for a moment what it's like to be shadowed by these images day in and day out. 
If one human being can do to another what has been done to us in those dark places, then for us, anyone is capable of anything at any time for any reason or no reason at all. The only defense is to withdraw far into oneself. Trust no one. Look out at the world with guarded eyes. Imagine living that type of life. Survivors live it every single day. For many survivors, torture, surviving torture, is far worse than the actual physical torture itself. The wounds heal in time, but the memories cling to us. Please, please, don't believe what you hear from some of our leaders pundits and experts. The physical act of waterboarding is torture. Psychological effects last far beyond that physical act. Psychological torture is time without end. No one fully recovers from torture. The damage done can never be undone. A few moments ago, I spoke the words of Jean Amory. Faith is never restored. Some 20 years after his torture, he killed himself. I would be remiss if I did not mention something about the triumph of the human will. With all that survivors endure, there are those who insist that they will not yield to their torturers, and one such group is Task International. We exist to support each other in any way we can, to speak out to the world about what we know intimately, the effects of torture, not only on ourselves, but on our families, our communities, and the society itself. And importantly, we work to confront torture wherever it may occur, and demand that those who have ordered it be held accountable. And that includes members of the Bush administration, including the president himself. What do survivors have to say to those who have never been tortured? In the words of the Holocaust historian Yehuda Bauer, Thou shalt not be a victim, thou shalt not be a perpetrator, and above all, thou shalt not be a bystander. Thank I was really pleased to have with us, although very painfully so, uh, Diana Ortiz. And, and what... <laughs> I mean, we, I know we all weep when we hear Diana, but what her presence here really signifies to me is what's absent uh, in the entire seven or eight years where this country has run an open and notorious torture program. And that's the absence of the survivors of that program. And I think what a difference it would make uh, in this country if we could have the mothers of Guantanamo outside the White House every single day um, instead of, I mean, it's wonderful to have the people in the jumpsuits. Uh, but the reason this torture debate, if you want to call it that, is so foolishly ignorant and stupid um, is because it's a debate among people who are not the survivors of torture.
And so I really want to thank Diana because I know, as you can see, it's not easy uh, for her to go back through what happened to her um, and to talk about it, um, but it's really important uh, for all of us to hear it. So thank you, Diana. Diana's case also um, is the Guatemala torture in the 80s. Um, it also tells us um, really what Andy was saying, uh, that when you hear this debate about we need torture to get information, we don't need torture. I mean, they do need torture to get the false information they use to get us into the Iraq war, um, but that's a different issue. But, but the, when you talk about getting information and this debate about it, uh, what the Guatemala cases illustrate really vividly, and what Diana's case in particular, is that torture is not about information. It's about domination and oppression. And it's about domination and oppression, whether it's in Guatemala, Afghanistan, or Iraq, and domination and oppression in our police precincts in the United States, or in our prisons in the United States. It's not about information. So while, yes, we have to call to abolish torture, to prosecute uh, the last set of the torture conspirators who have just left office, it's absolutely necessary uh, that the causes of torture, and torture itself is not some slogan to simply say abolish torture. We have to actually ultimately get rid of the causes and the system uh, that sets up a government uh, that tortures people not only in this country, but all over the world. The other impression I had in listening, of course, you heard, you heard Gita and she mentioned uh, the suicide at Guantanamo that took place yesterday. And you know, it just struck me in a way, it, just, it really, when I thought about this man who was 31 years old, been there for seven years, weighed at one point 87 pounds because he was on a hunger strike, uh, finally somehow figuring out how to take his own life. Um, it's just devastating. And it's not, it, and it's devastating You understand now that this is no longer Bush's Guantanamo. This is President Barack Obama's Guantanamo. And when that man, when that man takes his life, um, that's on President Barack Obama's hands. It's not any longer Bush's hands. And when we talk about, and you know, there's a big case that's always talked about the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs are the 17 men at Guantanamo from Western China. And they've been declared innocent even by this government and the last government and they shouldn't be at Guantanamo at all. And the Bush administration kept them there day after day. The courts ordered them released. The, the, first the Bush administration and then the Barack Obama administration said they, he would not parole them into the country, which he could do. Uh, so they have now been there uh, four months, innocent men under this current administration. We fight in this country to get people out of prison then when they're down at uh, what we used to call the tombs, but 100 Center Street. Uh, for one night, and these men, day after day, week after week, Obama, with the stroke of the pen, could bring them into Washington, where they would be put, they would be living with we other Uyghur families, and he hasn't done it. So again, I want to say, the innocent and the others at Guantanamo are now really in Barack Obama's hands, and it is his Guantanamo. You know, back in the days when, uh, when George Bush was president, uh, we at the center took very, very strong positions on the issues we've been talking about tonight. We took strong positions that Guantanamo must be closed. And by closed, I don't just mean physically closed, but I mean getting rid of the policies, the practices, and the unlawfulness uh, that underlies what Guantanamo is. We said that detainees had to either be charged in court uh, or repatriated to their countries. No third way, uh, no preventive detention. We said that those to be tried, whatever the number, whether it's 10 or 15, it's a small number of the 240 remaining, um, had to be tried in federal courts. No military commissions. We said that torture had to be ended completely, no exceptions, no matter what. We said that those officials in this government responsible for torture had to be investigated and prosecuted by a special prosecutor. 
Those were five clear demands that the progressives were ma making, lawyers even representing the Guantanamo detainees were making, many of us were making in the Bush administration. The principles underlying those demands, uh, they aren't Democratic principles, they aren't Republican principles, they're fundamental principles, and they don't change just because the Democrats are in office and not the Republicans. I bring this up now, really, in the context of the speech uh, that President Obama made and was referred to at the National Archives on May 21st. I can tell you this, we at CCR did not find the President's position in that speech acceptable, and we said so. In fact, a day before the meeting, uh, President Obama did something that President Bush would never have done. He invited the Center for Constitutional Rights and our executive director and a number of other human rights groups to meet with him the day before he gave the speech. Vince Warren went down, our executive director at the center, for the center. Uh, and he got a glimpse of what the president was going to say the next day in his speech. And here is how he left the meeting in a statement Vince said. I came out of the meeting deeply disappointed in the direction that the administration is taking and I don't see meaningful differences between these detention policies and those erected by President Bush. So there you have it. The next day at CCR, we're sitting around, we're sitting around the room and watching the speech at the National Archives. And there's uh, President Obama, a very effective speaker. National Archives, the place where the Constitution is housed, the Bill of Rights uh, is housed. And, and, Ob and President Obama effectively talked about those two founding documents and talked about their meaning and how important uh, they were. It was an extremely compelling beginning to the speech. Uh, he then proposed for Guantanamo, torture, and other types of, and other issues like that, state secrecy, solutions that were not very different from those of President Bush's. He added some bells and whistle, whistles, which I'll mention, but the, but the solutions, uh, if you want to call them that, uh, were roughly the same. One striking part of the speech, and I'm sure many of you picked up on it, was the word absolutists. He referred in the speech uh, to absolutists on two sides. One set of absolutists were those who said they would do anything in the name of national security, that they would violate fundamental values and they would do anything. The other set of absolutists were those who put values over security, as if holding on to our fundamental values against torture is somehow putting, putting uh, values over security. And of course, those two poles, one is the Cheney poll, the other is the poll of those of us on this stage and in this audience and at the center who actually believe that there's certain fundamental values that you can never violate. And he talks about how the Americans don't believe in two absolutes. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most offensive equations I could have hear, I could have heard, because here you have him saying that someone like Cheney, who, put, who says we can do anything, uh, is the equivalent of someone like the Center for Constitutional Rights, or like me, or the people on this stage. And what he's saying is that those who torture are akin to those who say we can never torture. Those who say we can have a Guantanamo are akin to those who say we can never have a Guantanamo. Uh, I don't think you really have to say, say it more dramatically uh, to understand uh, what is really going on on that issue and that Obama then says, President Obama then says he's going to take a middle ground. Well, the middle ground is really not a middle ground. The middle ground is one much closer uh, to, uh, to the Bush policies uh, that we've talk, talked about. Uh, when, that, when that speech was over, uh, I concluded and we issued a release at the office that said the President wrapped himself in the Constitution and then proceeded to violate it. Uh, and that's exactly what that speech did. You know, I have to tell you this, and, and Jeremy will, will, I think, confirm it, and Laura as well, um, that that message uh, that many of the most pernicious and nasty policies are being continued by the current administration does not sit well with people who I considered our allies in the struggle against these practices in the Bush administration. Many, they offer many excuses, you've heard some of them, 
it's too soon, the DOD, the Department of Defense is pushing him, uh, the CIA is pushing him, he has too much on the right pushing him, and of course he has the Democrats now voting 90 to 6 to not uh, take a Guantanamo detainee in the United States. But I have to tell you, there's no excuses, uh, no excuses that can be given for military commissions, preventive detention, torture, or uh, giving impunity uh, to the torture conspirators. A democratic Guantanamo, a democratic Guantanamo is not better than a Republican Guantanamo. A, Demo a democratic military commission is not better than a Republican military commission, even if they add bells and whistles to it. A democratic preventive detention scheme is not better than a Republican preventive detention scheme. And let me say, what we have now at Guantanamo, what we had under Bush, is a preventive detention scheme. And what President Barack Obama said is he would add due process to it. He would get, let people challenge their, they, you know, it's going to basically hold people without charges and without trials, but because they're dangerous. But you'll be able to go to court, like we do a bit now with Guantanamo, and challenge it, and have a lawyer and get due process and all these kind of bells and whistles. But the end result is still the barbaric end result that you can be held forever, perpetually, in a prison somewhere in the world forever and never actually be charged with a crime. So you can put all the bells and whistles in front of it, but in the end you have a barbaric practice at the end. And when you think about it, when you think about it, the analogy that came to mind was the death penalty for me. The death penalty is barbaric, like preventive detention is barbaric, like torture is barbaric. And they put all these bells and whistles in front of the death penalty. They call it due process. But in the end, the result is the same. People are sentenced to die, and they get murdered. That's what happens. And in preventive detention, they can do everything that Barack Obama is saying. But in the end, people will be, not even sentenced, sent to jail forever, indefinitely. Um, it's, it, it's not a difference, in my view, uh, with any kind of distinction uh, from the Bush administration practice. The other two issues are torture and, the process, and accountability. And of course, it's been said, and Jeremy's articles are really excellent on the immediate reaction forces in Guantanamo and the torture that's going on there currently, the forced feeding that's going on there, uh, and the torture in other sites we never even get into, the bagrams of the world. We just don't get lawyers in there. Uh, and again, in that, even, even in those practices, even when he said he abolished torture in the executive order, um, he actually left some of the regime, it's called Annex M of the Army Field Manual, it allows sensory deprivation, it allows uh, sleep deprivation, uh, it allows isolation. So it's not over by a long shot. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Guantanamo is the part we see, we see the most visibly, uh, but it's still there. And then, of course, uh, President Obama has been, there's only one way to say it, just awful on the issue of accountability, on the issue of a special prosecutor, on the issue of holding people accountable. And you know, it's, it's really appalling. When I hear the words, we have to think about the future and not go back to the past, it's really a disingenuous statement. Uh, because if we're thinking about a future without torture, you get that, you get that by holding accountable the torturers. You get that by deterring torture in the future. You don't do that. You don't do that by giving them impunity, and you don't do that by signing an executive order and having photographers around it. So the next president that can come in can simply sign a different executive order and begin a torture program that hasn't really ended, but begin the whole hog torture program again. That's the next picture. Uh, I mean, in some way, it's the most disturbing picture of it all, that, that the, the illegality of torture is determined by who happens to be uh, the president at a particular moment. Uh, it's unacceptable, uh, and it means uh, that we really need to push on this issue. 
I'd like to say, I think we've made great progress on the prosecution issue. You know, the center was out there with a number of other people and organizations uh, saying, prosecute, we have to have accountability. In our groups, even among the human rights groups, we were laughed at. We never, it's never going to happen. You can't get it. And slowly, slowly, as we get memos, as we get more, as we get the, send, the congressional reports, as we get, eventually we'll get these photographs, I think there's a buildup, a buildup uh, toward prosecution. I think the European cases, the fact that there's a case that will have teeth in it going on in Spain, with the same judge who prosecuted Pinochet, um, has some non-symbolic effects that are important. For example, uh, Secret former Secretary of Defense Haynes is, of course, a lawyer for a major oil company, Chevron, um, and must have to go to Europe a lot. Let me tell you, any, any administration official, but particularly the ones that are being looked at in Spain, uh, former administration, are taking their lives in their hands if they go into Europe. Uh, there's 27 or 28 countries in the European Union uh, that can very, mu very much uh, issue arrest warrants uh, for those people. So there's progress on that front. <laughs> so in the end, really, um, our, work, our work is not so different, um, even though we get invited to the White House on occasion. Um, is, which never would have happened, uh, never happened to the Center for Constitutional Rights ever in its life. It's almost embarrassing to mention it. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but we have our work to do. Um, and uh, I know all of you are, are with us on it, um, that, uh, that we, know, we know we're doing the right thing. I do think in this issue, uh, at least on part of this issue, on accountability, I think we're making progress uh, and we will um, we will move that, move it forward. I, I think the demands are clear. I mean, there can't be any repackaged Guantanamo. You understand, they're going to close it physically, and then they're going to have preventive detention and military commissions and stick people in a prison somewhere else, and then give it a legal, a little legal gloss to it, uh, so it looks better. Uh, but in a sense, it's rewrapping it or repackaging Guant Guantanamo. So the answer has to be no more Guantanamo, but no more Guantanamos or look-alikes uh, at all. Um, there can't be any preventive detention. That to me, as you understand, is to me that's crossing the Rubicon. It's actually the fact that we're in that point in this country. I see a big zero. I'm going to end in a second here. Um, the fact that we're actually seriously contemplating preventive detention is really, to me, about a declining empire. Uh, it's really saying um, that these are the kinds of techniques and means we now need uh, to control a uh, world, a population, uh, whatever, um, that no longer will accept uh, U.S. hegemony if they ever did. Um, so we need no preventive detention. Obviously, military commissions are just ridiculous. I mean, it's like even hard for me to believe those words came out of President Obama's mouth. I mean, we have federal courts for 225 years in this country, and they're talking about military commissions. You also understand all of these things we've talked about, including torture as we get to it? You know, they're not doing it against Christians. They're not doing it against Jews. They're doing it against Muslims. So all of these techniques, every one of them, um, really have to be understood as essentially and fundamentally racist. And when people say, well, it's only for this exception and for this, That's what they are, and let's not have any, any doubt about it. If Guantanamo had people, uh, Christians down there, you wouldn't be seeing this. Um, so we have to get rid of that. Uh, we obviously have to get back off the page of torture, uh, but as Diana's case illustrates, this has an unfortunate and sad history in this country uh, and a long history. The one difference I see with the current situation and the current and the, and the areas of the past are that this time they're actually are essentially acknowledging it, debating it, and not denying it. And so that really is, again, an illustration of how badly we've moved uh, in a direction of really, uh, of really, I would only have to say, the uncivilized. And finally, um, and yes, and this is the demand we have to have, uh, is that the torture conspirators have to be held accountable. Think of the difference. If they had been investigating Cheney now, if he was close to being indicted, um, yeah, maybe he'd be out there on the airwaves, uh, but he'd be out there as a, uh, as a suspect and as a defendant. 
in a, in a, in a, in a torture, uh, torture prosecution. So thank you for being here. It's clearly a critical moment uh, in this country. There's actually a possibility for change, um, and we're all going to have to do, uh, do our best to make it. Thanks. This is Chris Hedges, who is uh, currently a senior fellow at the Nation Institute, and he was spent two decades as a foreign correspondent in Central America and in the Mideast. He was the New York Times bureau chief there. Uh, Chris Hedges. Um, I spent about 20 years abroad, and in most uh, of those countries, torture, like war, was endemic. I uh, was in Argentina at the end of the Dirty War. I covered Pinochet's Chile. I was in El Salvador and Guatemala, as well as Nicaragua for five years from 1983 to 1988, on to the Middle East, uh, and then in the former Yugoslavia, covering the war in uh, Bosnia, where I was based in Sarajevo, when the city was being hit with 2,000 Serbian shells a day under constant sniper fire. And in every conflict that I covered, torture was an integral part of the weapon of war, because torture is the natural outcome of the culture of war. And it is the culture of war, the moral nihilism of war, that has infected our society in the same way that it infected those societies. Once you enter a binary worldview of us and them, of black and white, of good and evil, once you raise yourself to moral heights that implicitly denigrate the morality of others, once you dehumanize whole segments of your own population or populations that you oppose as human impediments to progress, torture becomes inevitable. Because in a war, in the landscape of war, human beings become objects, objects to either gratify or destroy or both. And in every war that I covered, it very soon became apparent to the killers that the routine of death uh, needed to be um, enhanced. And this is why we would see bodies crucified on the sides of barns in Bosnia, decapitations, mutilations. It's why human bodies were used to deliver messages. When I covered the war in El Salvador, the death squads were killing between 700 and 1,000 people a month one morning outside of the Camino Royale where we were working, left three bodies of campesinos, no doubt innocent, and they had cut off their genitals and stuffed them in the mouths of these corpses. These corpses greeted us. They knew we gathered every morning in the parking lot at dawn. You only work in daylight hours in a war zone. And on these corpses, they had put a sign that you, the piricuaco, was the slang term of sort of bastards in the press. This is what will happen to you. When you permit a class of killers and torturers as we have to be unleashed, you empower sadists. And that, of course, is what we have done. And let's remember that only 1% of those we hold are actually in Guantanamo. Uh, the Obama administration uh, has uh, forbidden 
uh, any inspection of what is being done in Bagram, uh, as well as the black sites around the world. Uh, when torture begins, uh, the process, and we saw this in, uh, through the U.S. Army School of the Americas, uh, where 57,000 Latin American military, including Anastasio Somoza, Manuel Noriega, Roberto Dalbasson, Leopoldo Galtieri, were all trained, uh, uh, unleashed uh, this, uh, these techniques on Latin America, you saw uh, that uh, very quickly torture was used as a kind of preemptive mechanism so that uh, initially you may have uh, picked up people who uh, may indeed have uh, been the head of a dissident labor union or an Islamist uh, cell that you suspect. Uh, but in the process of torture, there's a kind of centrifugal force where these people are tortured. Uh, they name others who invariably, I can tell you from experience, usually turn out to be innocent. Any name to make the pain stop. These people are picked up and brought in, and there is a kind of sweeping uh, uh, or a rolling effect uh, to torture. Um, I, I think one of the things that has uh, disturbed uh, those of us uh, so deeply who have come out of environments where torture is unleashed is that always uh, these techniques are uh, used on uh, a defined segment of the population as the enemy, uh, but always leech into uh, the uh, society at large when uh, it is not stopped. Uh, the, uh, you know, Michael said that, and it is true that this is a campaign that is at its core racist, uh, but in a societal breakdown which we may very well face uh, in the months ahead, uh, especially uh, as we desperately try and weigh borrow our way back to uh, a, a, a speculative or bubble economy, uh, I think only uh, prolonging perhaps by months uh, an inevitable collapse, uh, you will find these techniques and of course uh, the hundreds of people who have been trained to use them within your own midst. Uh, so they may be Muslims today, uh, but they may very well be Christians and Jews and agnostics and atheists and even members of revolution books tomorrow. Uh, uh, once you uh, uh, unleash these forces within society, uh, there is uh, almost no holding them back. And uh, I think almost every conflict that I covered uh, bears this out. Uh, when you look at, for instance, the dirty war in Argentina, uh, which 30,000 of its own citizens disappeared, uh, you saw uh, how uh, this subterranean force that lacked any kind of oversight and any kind of control uh, mushroomed throughout the society and uh, uh, rent and tore Argentina apart. Um, there uh, is within uh, the uh, techniques that are used in uh, Guantanamo and Bagram and other places, uh, this, uh, and, and we've talked about waterboarding, which is banned, but the, 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 uh, the physical breakdown is, is, is this no-touch interrogation. And uh, these were techniques that were developed uh, by, primarily by psychiatrists and others who, of course, are in Guantanamo uh, to monitor the physical deterioration and mental deterioration of the prisoners. These techniques were uh, developed during the Cold War, and uh, they uh, have created uh, sophisticated mechanisms by which people can be broken to a catatonic state through sensory deprivation, exhaustion, isolation. Uh, it's why you see people blindfolded, why you see them covered, and why you see uh, earphones on their heads. And um, that, that uh, technique, which I think, uh, when I covered the fall of East Germany, they talked about uh, the, the Gestapo broke bones and the Stasi broke souls. And I think that technique uh, that technique of the physical disintegration of the soul, uh, the reduction of somebody to uh, essentially a, a fetal state, uh, is, uh, can often be parsed in a way by legal experts like John Yu and others. And remember in the Inquisition there were no shortage of legal experts that made everything done by the Inquisitors legal, uh, courtesy of Leola and the Jesuits. Um, 
And, and I think that, that, that what we fail to understand is that by simply removing waterboarding uh, and keeping all of these other mechanisms, which we have scientifically determined can reduce human beings uh, to, uh, to, to, to essentially states of insanity, um, we have not in any way blocked uh, the effects of torture. Uh, you heard about the force feeding. Uh, there are 30 men right now uh, being force fed. It's fascinating that uh, at the beginning of uh, these interrogations, when people were picked up in black sites, uh, they were uh, often uh, uh, force fed at a way to get them talk. Uh, and, uh, and now every time they begin a hunger strike, they are immediately, uh, before, while they're healthy, before they um, uh, uh, descend into any kind of physical decay, they are immediately strapped to these chairs four to five hours a day, covered in vomit, uh, and, uh, and used essentially, to, and the pain becomes so unbearable that they break any kind of uh, resistance. Um, the um, feedings, uh, uh, which uh, the CIA calls dietary manipulation uh, is considered, uh, according to the uh, manuals for interrogation, uh, a legal conditioning technique. A lot of these people are just fed every four hours this dietary supplement called Ensure Plus, which is often mixed with a laxative uh, that, uh, it, it, of course, uh, means that people are soon sitting in their own excrement. Um, uh, I think that the, um, and there's going to be a great article on this, which I urge you to get in a few days when it comes out in Harper's uh, by Luke uh, Mitchell called Yes, We Can Still Torture. Uh, he details uh, by interviewing many of the uh, victims uh, or the people who have been in Guantanamo, um, the processes that are still underway. Um, I think the uh, fear for those of us who come out of societies uh, that have been uh, convulsed by fear and that have resorted to torture as a mechanism uh, for control is that uh, in our own society should we, well, uh, when I covered, uh, covered Al-Qaeda after 9-11 based in Paris and uh, there wasn't an intelligence chief that I interviewed anywhere in Europe that year who ever used the word when uh, or if when they were talking about another terrorist attack on American soil but only when. And I think that should we uh, suffer uh, another domestic terrorist attack, should we stuff for another catastrophic uh, uh, terrorist strike or, or an economic meltdown, uh, these kinds of techniques which have already been integrated into our society uh, will uh, uh, be practiced uh, not in these offshore penal colonies and these black sites but on American soil. Uh, that not only is this a violation against the rights and dignity of others, uh, not only has it unleashed a class of sadists and killers, not only is it woefully ineffective uh, and illegal and immoral, uh, but as Thucydides understood in the declining days of the, Athen the Athenian Empire, the tyranny that, as Thucydides wrote, the tyranny that Athens imposed on others, uh, it soon imposed on itself. And it was uh, empire and tyranny that destroyed Athenian democracy, and all of the tools of empire and tyranny uh, that, uh, that killed uh, the light of Athenian democracy. And I think we too, when we battle against torture, uh, are not only standing up uh, for international law and for uh, uh, the sanctity of human life, uh, but finally for the protection of our very anemic uh, democratic state. Thank you. Juma al Dosari, a 33 year old Bahraini national, is the father of a young daughter. He has been held at Guantanamo Bay for more than five years. In addition to being detained without charge or trial, Dosari has been subjected to a range of physical and psychological abuses. He has been held in solitary confinement since the end of 2003, and according to the US military, has tried to kill himself 12 times while in prison. On one occasion, he was found by his lawyer hanging by his neck and bleeding from a gash in his arm. Death Poem by Jamal Dosari. 
Take my blood. Take my death shroud and the remnants of my body. Take photographs of my corpse at the grave, lonely. Send them to the world, to the judges and to the people of conscience. Send them to the principled men and the fair-minded. And let them bear the guilty burden before the world of this innocent soul. Let them bear the burden before their children and before history of this wasted, sinless soul, of this soul which has suffered at the hands of the protectors of peace. Many men at Guantanamo turned to writing poetry as a way to maintain their sanity, to memorialize their suffering, and to preserve their humanity through acts of creation. The psychic toll that Guantanamo has taken on the detainees is unfathomable. Their poems, all written inside the wire, were composed with little expectation of ever reaching an audience beyond the small circle of their fellow prisoners. The obstacles they have faced in composing their poems are profound. The Pentagon refuses to allow most of the detainees' poems to be made public, arguing that poetry presents a special risk to national security because of its content and format. In the first year of their detention, many were not allowed the use of a pen and paper. Some would draft short poems on styrofoam cups they had retrieved from their lunch and dinner trays. Lacking writing instruments, they would inscribe their words with pebbles or trace out letters with small dabs of toothpaste, then pass the cup poems from cell to cell. The poems you are hearing tonight were declassified, collected, and published in 2007 as Poems from Guantanamo, edited by Mark Falkoff. Sheikh Abur Rahim Muslim Dost is a Pakistani poet and essayist who spent nearly three years in Guantanamo with his brother. Dost was a respected religious scholar, poet, and journalist, author of 20 books before his arrest in 2001. While at Guantanamo, he composed thousands of lines of poetry in Pashto, most of which were retained by the US military after his release in 2005. In October 2006, shortly after Dost and his brother published a memoir of their Guantanamo detention, Dost was again arrested by Pakistani intelligence. He has not been heard from since. Cup Poem One by Sheikh Abdul Rahim Muslim Dost. What kind of spring is this? where there are no flowers, and the air is filled with a miserable smell. Upon his release, his daughter told him the censored lines were a poem she had copied for him. One, two, three, four, five. Once I caught a fish alive. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then I let it go again. Released in 2005, he was never charged with a crime. The biggest problem at Guantanamo, he explained to Amnesty International, is the sheer lack of any ability to prove your innocence because you remain in limbo in legal limbo and have no meaningful communication with your family. Begg published a memoir, Enemy Combatant, My Imprisonment at Guantanamo, Bagram, and Kandahar. Homeward Bound by Moazam Begg. 
begins this journey without reins, ends in capture without aims, now lying in the cell, awake with merriment and smiles all fake. Freedom is spent, time is up, tears have rent my sorrow's cup. Home is cage and cages steel, thus manifest realities unreal. Dreams are shattered, hopes are battered, yet with new status one is flattered. The irony of it, detention and all, be so small and stand so tall. Years of tears and days of toil are now but fears and tyrants spoil. Ordainment has surely come to pass, but endure alone, one must face this farce. Now patience is of virtue taught, and virtue is of iron wrought. So poetry is set, perhaps with appreciation met. Still, the paper do I pen, knowing what, but never when. As dreams begin and nightmares end, I'm homeward bound to beloved tend. Osama Abu Kabir was a Jordanian water truck driver who worked for the municipality of Greater Amman. After joining an Islamic missionary organization called Jama'at al-Tablighi, he traveled to Afghanistan where he was detained by anti-Taliban forces and handed over to the U.S. military. One of the justifications offered for his continued detention is that he was captured wearing a Casio digital watch, a brand supposedly favored by members of Al-Qaeda because some models may be used as bomb detonators. Kabir remains at Guantanamo. Is it true? by Osama Abu Kabir. Is it true that the grass grows again after the rain? Is it true that the flowers will rise up in the spring? Is it true that birds will migrate home again? Is it true that the salmon swim back up their stream? It is true. This is true. These are all miracles. But is it true that one day we'll leave Guantanamo Bay? Is it true that one day we'll go back to our homes? I said in my dreams, I am dreaming of home. To be with my children, each one part of me. To be with my wife and ones that I love. To be with my parents, my world's tenderest hearts. I dream to be home, to be free from this cage. But do you hear me, O oh judge? Do you hear me at all? We are innocent here. We've committed no crime. Set me free. Set us free. If anywhere still, justice and compassion remain in this world. <laughs> 